Hello and welcome to Exploring Global Problems, a podcast where we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges, from health innovation to sustainable futures in the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Sam Blacksland and today I'm joined by Yogesh Devedi, Professor of Digital Marketing and Innovation, and Dr Laurie Hughes, Senior Lecturer in Information Systems, both here at Swansea. Yogesh's research explores information systems and marketing, focusing on issues related to consumer adoption and emerging digital innovations. Laurie focuses on the impact of Gen AI, including chat GPT. Yogesh, Laurie, welcome to Exploring Global Problems. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Now, obviously, I've used a lot of words there, which um, a a lot of people, I think, will have a sense of what they mean, but perhaps we should just do some sort of uh, definitions. But as well as that, can you just tell me, in general, what you research and kind of what it's all about and some of your key findings. So we'll go uh, Yogesh first. Yeah, so uh, we've been actually theoretically and conceptually um, looking at the topic of generative AI, artificial intelligence in general, uh, and uh, chat GPT uh, more specifically uh, in recent times. And uh, what we've been looking at are what are the major challenges posed by this new technology, as well as what opportunities offered by this particular um, developments, and uh, of course, it's going to be different from different for different people, different stakeholder. So, how different people will benefit from it, or what kind of consequences people may uh, face mm. through that? Yeah, it's 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 the, the it's the big topic in some ways at the moment, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. I mean, everyone talking about it, and uh, and and that's very much. Uh, kind of timely and um, appropriate, mm. f- given what is going on. Yes. So, yeah. Laurie. The focus of our research really is um, how organisations and people adopt um, artificial intelligence. So we're not t- coming from a computer science background. Mm. So we look at how uh, organisations use this to improve their productivity, impact on business models, uh, and how people may uh, do the jobs differently through this sort of technology. Great. Now, I used uh, a word there, generative AI, and I know that you focus on that specifically. What, what do we actually mean when we when we say that? Well, generative AI um, has been around for quite some time. People don't realise that. It's been around for, uh, I think, a few decades now. Mm. Uh, the difference now is that there is a, a massive amount of data that's available, and that's transformed the way that we can uh, use this sort of technology. And the way to think about it is that um, the technology... Uh, builds a model. And I suppose the way to think about that is um, if you're running something on a laptop, for example, and you might load something to memory, think of that as a model and compare that to perhaps doing something like an internet search, for example. Now, your generative model builds it in a way that you can access uh, very quickly. So all the data, all the uh, answers that you might get based upon a query for generative AI comes from that model. And that model is built and trained on um, a whole host of internet sources, uh, books, uh, some elements of academia, articles. So all the information that perhaps you might get from a search in the internet that's done perhaps looking at uh, a server somewhere uh, on on the cloud, the difference here is it's already generated for you based upon data that's been learnt through that particular generative, so the generation of that model. Mm. And, and a huge amount of data as well. We're talking massive. We're talking bigger than we can really comprehend, aren't we? Because it's yeah. it, it's is it silly to say it's almost everything that is online. Is, yeah, it's it's potent, yes. that's possibly what you can access. Or what and it, and can, it can take weeks and months to, to to generate these sorts of models because it's so so vast, really. And if I use a very general example, mm. consider these models as a child. Mm. You know, when child is born and growing up, don't know any words. Uh, but slowly and slowly pick up by seeing, by learning, by just having the awareness of what is going on around and start reacting and doing things the way adult do things. Same way these models are actually. Mm-hmm. The models at the beginning knows nothing and therefore they would not generate something sensible. But when they are trained based on this massive data, um, they learn through that and then they start uh, giving responses that are very, very much human-like. Well, I was just about to say, it sounds like we're humanising it in some ways, isn't it? Absolutely. And I know the word artificial is there, but the idea of intelligence makes it feel very 
personal, very human. And and I guess is is this does this feed into some of the anxieties and concerns that people have about this? Because obviously they start to think, I guess, robots and things taking over. Yeah, yes. And and I think that is one of the problems really. We've given this technology that title of mm. intelligence. Anthropomorphised it yes. almost. Yeah. And, yeah. And, I, and I think that, that when I think of where we are now in terms of artificial intelligence, to me, it's still computer code and data. Mm. And I still think of it in that way. And when we provide or when we describe this technology in human terms, so for example, when uh, a bit of generative AI gets the wrong result, we call it a hallucination, <laughs> where it sort of makes things up. Now we're giving it those human attributes and um, people think in that way, but it isn't really intelligent. It's, it's very capable and it's incredible what it can do, but it is in no way intelligent. But we give it those terms, unfortunately. And that, that can have an emotive um, you know, consequence for people in general. I mean, it, it appears like intelligent and this capability will improve. Mm. So the so the limitation of AI, like generative AI and chat GPT, is that they obviously predict based on what is there. And, and they produce uh, something that looks uh, like a human would mm. have written or spoken or said. But the thing is that this system doesn't have general awareness, right? It doesn't have contextual awareness. That ability is not there yet. But given the ChatGPT 4 now has much higher capability than ChatGPT, and ChatGPT 5, they're saying that, will reach to almost near to human intelligence. Mm. So, so that's where, where they're adding more and more variables, more and more parameters, and that's actually increasing the contextual awareness of the system as well. So for now, we might see that it's not very much human-like, but going forward for a few years, you will see that this system will mimic very closely human behavior and human responses. Yeah, interesting. Well, you've brought it up. Can we talk a bit more about chat uh, G? PT, I'm just not sure I've got that one right. That I mean, I, I'd not heard of this until a few months ago, but we, a lot of people have now heard of it, haven't they? Mm. But if we were to take it back again to its basics just for a second, what is it? What does it do? ChatGPT, so it's a uh, generative pre-transformer mm. is um, how it's defined. The transformer, think of that as the sort of underlying architecture, I suppose, the sort of the plumbing that makes it work. Um, and that, that's not new technology, but again, the, the access or the availability of data now has meant that this technology can really uh, be, you know, quite uh, amazing. So, um, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, the, the fact that you can build a model now uh, using uh, this type of AI uh, to be able to interrogate almost anything, really, I think that's that's the key, incredible thing that um, that this technology can can do, and um, the fact that it's accessible to anyone really uh, for free with three point five, you can pay. Um, for four, and and I think that um, what's also quite incredible is the um, w when you get things back from a, a prompt, a query, it is um, so rich in terms of information, and and that conversational uh, aspect with it, um, deliberately that way, that chat mm. element, mm. that uh, also has problems too. So yes, it's very informative, and it might give you some great answers, but I think sometimes what we've seen is that people not quite switch their brains off when they get the result, but we need to really think about to question more uh, the results we get back from it because it, it, it looks so good, so eloquent. Yes, but it's not uh, as right, is it? True, and that is the, the major problem, really. We need to educate yeah. ourselves to assume yeah. it's not right. I mean, yeah. yeah, and that's interesting. You think that's, you think that's perhaps the key problem, that it's not always right. I mean, in, in my mind, because we talk about this a lot in higher education, don't we? Because chat GPT can write essays for you and everything sure. like that. One of my concerns is that's then stopping people from gaining the skills that is required from actually researching and writing an essay themselves. And I think that's really quite fundamental to the way that our brains are meant to work or that we should, the way that we should be teaching young people to try and think and sort of read long bits of text and kind of try and digest them. But what, 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 what do you think, Yogesh, about all of this, about this very big issue? Yeah, I mean, let me first add in that uh, ChatGPT, of course, uh, there are different techniques mm. uh, in artificial intelligence. And in ChatGPT is mainly based on uh, deep learning uh, 
aspect and uh, basically you just train the the algorithm using all big massive data now that data whatever publicly available uh, is copyrighted or is not copyrighted so lots of issue actually uh, comes through that uh, because you don't know the output is based on copyrighted material or not mm. if it's not copyrighted material that's okay that's that's fine to use but if it's copyrighted material then you probably violating certain law mm. and, and you might face consequences but now it comes to the question that um, you know using it i mean some people compare it with calculator when calculator came uh, you know people thought oh it's going to actually take away all the ability of the people to do mathematics by themselves at certain level it did actually so not everyone will able to calculate using their mind mm -hmm. they they would use calculator but at the same time calculators are very useful in various purposes in various contexts and for various purposes same way i would say chat gpt it is a tool uh, which you can used to make your work more efficient you become more productive but it's not going to kind of completely uh, take away the human need the, so human uh, input is would always be needed chat gpt will be great or any generative ai would be great if you have good domain knowledge because you need to difference you need to know what is producing what is generating is okay or not okay is appropriate or not appropriate if it's violating some law and regulations or not if you're not aware of that and you produce it and and submit somewhere you probably you know you probably violating certain mm -hmm. things so if people will rely completely on it perhaps that would be a mistake and that would not work for for foreseeable future i would say next 5 year i don't see that people can just take the output from chat gpt and can submit anywhere i think just taking the calculator kind of uh, analogy the, the the metaphor just yeah. uh, just for a second i mean with a calculator you need a a body of knowledge and understanding before you use it don't you whereas i think you know in my line of work in history for example you can just input a a question and it will come out with something without you having to do almost anything. Now, like we say, that something might not be very accurate, but it's probably going to get better at being more accurate. And therefore, the person using it has actually learnt very little. or They've done very little of the work or the skills themselves. I'm just playing devil's advocate here for a second, but I see, I, I, I see this as quite a, a a troubling development in some ways. Yeah. So, so I mean, um, I'm sure uh, my colleague Lori will uh, add something. But here, I would like to say that even that prompt that you use, even learning how well to use that prompt, is is important because it, how good your prompt are, responses will be based on that. And at the moment, we're just trying anything. you know people just putting anything and they actually using chat gpt almost like google so trying to throw any kind of question and trying to find but your responses will be as good as your 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 questions so and that's where now lots of discussion is happening on prompt engineering education lots of places are already talking about teaching people how to use chat gpt uh, and how to create prompt how to you know kind of use and how refine the responses mm -hmm. so that actually matters lori you, yeah, yeah i i think one of the problems is that uh, this has all happened so quickly so november or october november 22 was when chat gpt came out mm -hmm. and of course there are a few more large language models out now like bard and uh, whatever else um so we're still trying to um perhaps struggle to find out how to use these things properly but if to come back to your particular point about um that uh, chat gpt and other um large language models will produce almost all it for you mm. i come back to perhaps um thinking about a google search if i want to find out something about um doing podcasts uh, would i grab that particular content verbatim and put it in somewhere i would not so what we're finding is that 
uh, when people get the output back from ChatGPT based upon the prompt they put in, people, I mean, yes, some people will, will do paste it verbatim. I'm just thinking about the educational context here now. But most people will, will use it as a tool to say, OK, well, I'll, I'll put something in. Let's see what I get out. Is that a skeleton, a straw man? I mean, to then use that to produce something that's more substantive. Will it give me a starting point uh, to be able to develop something more in depth? Because it can, you know, help with ideas. And I think that's that's a very good use of it. And I think it comes back to using it as a tool. Now, when we come back to the calculator example, that's a very good one. And if you think back in history about uh, innovations and people think, oh, well, this is the real one that will change the world. Uh, things are different this time. And I think back to, um, you know, Dolly the Sheep, back when people think we'd be cloned everywhere. And in 10 years' time, five years' time, uh, everybody will be, you wouldn't recognise them as being real human beings. You won't know who's cloned and who's not. But that's sort of faded in the background. And I think here we're on the sort of, also this sort of panic curve of uh, innovations, really, where we're struggling to find out how to use this thing properly. And then as we sort of get used to things, we will adapt it uh, to it as a tool. We'll find out perhaps that there are jobs now that don't exist, that will exist in the near future, that will use this effectively. And people will be retrained and will settle down and we won't be so panic stricken, perhaps, as we are now with these massive job losses and things like that. I want to ask about jobs just in, in a minute, but before I do, in a nutshell, in the context of higher education and using this tool, are you both in favour of embracing it or of not, I guess? So for me, I think this is something you cannot avoid it. Mm. It's happening and you have to embrace it. You have to embrace it carefully. That's the point. You cannot just leave it as kind of wild. Uh, you cannot just give a free hand. So there need to be a uh, policy. Uh, there need to be a uh, procedure, mm. uh, both for teachers, learners, uh, and other uh, stakeholder within the higher education sector. Mm -hmm. So embracing is important because it's happening. And if you're not actually equipping your student with this skill, and then they're going to job market, they will face big problem. Sure. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I agree. I, I know that um, two well-known UK academic institutions have banned it, but good luck with that. I think that mm -hmm. we've got to, um, as Yogesh has said, uh, help students uh, use these tools effectively. And if you just think of it as just another tool, so yes, we have to adapt our teaching to be able to integrate its use. Now, not every subject, I mean, we teach AI, so it's a bit easier for us, really. But if you think about some other subjects and some other academics might see it as more of a threat, really, and more yeah. difficult to think of how to integrate the use of the tool with their teaching. But that's a challenge for us, and we've got to be able to adapt to it. Otherwise, the students will be knowing a lot more than us and we'll be sort of almost lost in a way. So we have to change with the times and be able to use this as part of our teaching effectively. I mean, our assessment need to be thought through again. Yeah. Uh, for sure, we cannot just examine them with the normal essay uh, and assignments that need to be more critical, something where machine cannot directly help, uh, and so that uh, basically you don't need to worry about that someone will uh, use ChatGPT to write the assignment or coursework. Mm -hmm. So this aspect need to change. That for sure, uh, many institutions already, many academics already taking that step, uh, but those not, they have to in, in very near future. And that's a challenge. So the normal setting and assessment, you've got to think very differently. And do we go back to multiple choice in an exam room mm -hmm. as the only form of assessment? I'd hope not. But, you know, people are really thinking about that because what else is there? That's, that's what some people are, are thinking. So we've got to perhaps think about integrating the use of the tool in a way that we can still allow students to critically analyse the topic that they're working on. But that, that, does that mean perhaps you're looking at some generative AI output, you're critiquing that output perhaps, looking for the flaws yes. in it, perhaps comparing that to another form 
of a literature review or whatever, but using the results that comes back more effectively in what they're trying to do. But we have to think about more laterally mm. about how to do that. Big, big challenges. I think even if even if you are very in, fully in favour of embracing it, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a big thing, isn't it? But, but we can't but, ignore it. That's the key thing. Uh, yeah. uh, understood, yeah. Well, this this point about jobs that we just touched upon a second ago, you know, I think if you if you look at, let's say, some of the coverage in the press that, that a lot of this has got, one of the main headlines is, you know, this will take people's jobs. So wh wh where are we on that? So in terms of job, um, of course, it's not yet fully clear. Uh, what I see that it, it's not going to replace job fully. What it will do, it will reduce the number of people needed to perform a job. So those who are good, who, who skill themselves with these kind of tools and able to perform the same task more efficiently, they will, be, uh, they will have no problem. They will continue the job. But those uh, would resist this change and would not learn, they probably have reason to worry about. Mm. Um, so the, the the human in loop will be there always. I don't think we will ever uh, remove people from any job fully. But what will happen, because these tools make things easier and quicker to do, then one person's job can be done, uh, two person's job can be done by one person, right? Yeah, which means less people, less people. in work. Yes. Yeah. But that's, yeah. a, that's a huge potential problem, isn't it? Well... It is a problem, but but then it will create another type of job. It will but also, just, but less of, but less of them. No, probably similar of them. Okay. Many many okay. different type of job because you know we think that uh, we were discussing the other day actually uh, in another talk that um, people think that oh it's so quick uh, to do things through this, but when content is created and if it is important place, you need. You know, specialist people to to actually evaluate that content before it can be used. So those kind of role will emerge, and and uh, it would not be so definitely like you know any kind of revolution happen when one kind of things gone, then other emerged. Similar kind of things happen here. That of course traditional job lesser number of people will be needed but then many different type of job will emerge mm. uh, uh, in this particular domain I was having this debate with my builder a few weeks ago mm. and I said to him well I think that uh, Boston Dynamics who are well known sort of robot producer are decades away from taking over your job but sure. I think that if you think back to society and you think about industrial revolution and all the skills perhaps and professions that were disrupted by automation. You can go all the way back through history. Now, humans adapt and evolve and new types of jobs are created. And I suspect that, you know, we could um, chew the fat about creating job titles now that are going to be developed as a direct result of Gen I. We couldn't even think about them now and perhaps in a few years' time because it's happening so quickly. So I don't think there's going to be a huge impact on the amount of work that humans do. I don't think we're at a level where it's universal basic income and we're going to have to sort of, you know, think about how to occupy humans. I don't agree with that at all. Mm. I think that certain jobs will be disrupted. People will be using more of Gen I technology as a tool to do things. Jeez. But as Yogesh is saying, humans will still be in the loop using this technology as a way of being more more proficient, more productive. And, and I, I think yeah, that's yeah. the key. That's the key skill, really. And I can see the argument there that it leads to potentially uh, a wealthier uh, economy. And if we can do yeah. things more efficiently and be sure. more productive, yeah. that's, like, that's a really noble aim in and of itself. Uh, yeah. I guess the what I put back to you is that it, if if a machine can, say, do two people's meaningful job, like a more a meaningful job that people get structure and routine and enjoyment out of, and perhaps then puts them into something which is less structured, less meaningful, is that something we should be wanting or, or aiming for? Because ultimately humans need to be, this sounds quite philosophical here, but humans need to be human, don't they, and do things that maybe bring them into contact with people and sort of socialise and things like that. And is there a danger there that perhaps what you have instead of people being, I don't know, on the on the shop floor with colleagues and interacting with them or they're in some kind of office or warehouse on their own pressing buttons and, and doing technological things. I don't know, that's just a that's just a an idea, an example of what might be a problem. Well sometimes it's a solution as well. I think about Japan that has the most mm. robots as in the society. 
They've got robotic sort of uh, devices to help older people because there isn't enough younger people to, to help. And they develop a bond with this technology yeah. and um, it helps their mental health. Um, so there's certainly positives. Uh, but when it comes to sort of, you know, um, AI taking over some of the aspects of life that we find pleasurable, I don't think that direction would go that way. Mm. We're doing, we're, we're going to be developing this technology to do the things we don't like to do really, that we can automate and uh, we can concentrate on other things. I think that's the way society will go. I mean, one other thing, I mean, see, it's human creativity, right? So human creativity, that aspect, I think it will be very difficult to mimic in the generative AI or any artificial intelligence systems, it would do as good as it things are there. Uh, the content that that is already there and is learning, it would not able to exceed that. It will not able to bring something, you know, very new that's never mm. existed. So I think human input for that region also would be very much needed for various aspects. Because if you look at lots of developments that happens, you cannot do without creativity and innovation. You know, uh, even generative AI also is an example of innovation, right? Oh, understood. Yeah. And, yeah. and that in itself has a human root and a human yeah, cause. Absolutely. Certainly it's drawing from human yeah. information. I certainly yeah. understood that. But it can... Some of these systems can compose symphonies, though, can't they? And yes. They can make. Yes. They, they, they can make pictures that people yep. don't know if it was drawn or created by a human or a machine. I don't know. There is a. That seems that does seem very futuristic. It does. It does. I mean, some of those uh, Dolly or some other uh, tools they do bring out some, you know, amazing kind of art. But again, the prompt is given by the human. Mm. The pro human tells what they want. It's not like you just say, create something and it will create. No, you define what you want and then it creates by combining those things. So again, human creativity is there. Is a role. It's not generative AI. Generative AI is implementing it, but you actually dictating it. So I assume so, neither of you are on board with the... Um the man whose name I've forgotten, but he worked for Google for a very long time. He's sort of the god, one of the, considered to be one of these godfathers of mm. AI. Jeffrey who's, Hinton, yeah. yes, yeah. Jeffrey Hinton, who's yeah. who's does seem very sceptical, cynical, negative, whatever you want to say about the direction in which things are going. I suppose you're not uh, Team Hinton on this. Well, I mean, look, uh, my view is quite balanced on here. I feel this is an one of innovations. We have seen several such innovations. Of course, this is a bit more riskier one given the nature. And therefore, we need policies, mm. regulations yeah. to uh, govern it, to manage it. But otherwise, we don't need to worry so much about it. It is one of the innovation. We will, as AI will evolve, human will evolve, evolve along with AI to in terms of how to use it and how to uh, work with it. So I'm not too worried about that it will, um, it's not an existential risk as people project. As Jeffrey Hinton mentioned, as Elon Musk mm. uh, sometime uh, says, uh, or even that uh, we also had, you know, big scientists also long ago uh, predicted that AI will uh, kind of have consequences for human race, uh, you know. So I, I don't think I see in that way. I think you've got to be um, suspicious sometimes of people's agendas. So Elon Musk, of course, he came out a little while ago saying he thought we should stop the bus, that things are getting too evolved here. And then, of course, on the side, he's creating his own company. Gen AI company. So, yeah. you know, you've got to be you know, very sceptical. I think what, what it'll do, though, um, just thinking about the evolution from a societal perspective, it'll perhaps make us think differently about what is the truth, uh, what is a fact that we can rely upon. So if I saw a, a video of Yogesh doing something or a picture, still picture, you know, before all this, I would obviously believe what's there. But of course, I can do anything with that particular image. I can manipulate it in any shape or form. So as a society, we have to question a lot more about what we are seeing in front of us, not just the narrative form, but any sort of multimedia form as well. And I think that'll take a while to sink in, really, because the technology is so great. So, for example, if I wanted to perhaps, you know, hack into your account or perhaps pretend 
um, to sort of uh, spoof something in, in an account that you hold, I could perhaps, you know, simulate, um, you know, an image or something you might recognize. Uh, I could um, produce something which perhaps um, would make you think that I'm friend, not foe, mm -hmm. to be able to uh, get you to react, to respond to an email, to get some more personal information from you. So as a society, we have to be more on our guard about what is a fact. We can't take the traditional things that we would define as being fact as uh, the case. Yeah, let me let me add something in this that, you, look, you have atomic energy and atomic technology, right? You can use it for generating energy or you can use it to make atomic bomb and, you know, and that can be used sure. for very uh, different purposes. Same way. I mean, that is also governed and controlled. I think definitely AI technology need that label of governance. It would need a uh, very tight uh, governance, both from the government side, as well as, you know, the, the private sector has to be responsible. And and that's a whole area of responsible AI people talking about, mm -hmm. you know, where, where how unbiased the system is in terms of data, in terms of method, in terms of other things. And... Um, and and how well it's used, basically. So it is not about technology, it's about how we're going to use it. But now Elon Musk has founded the company that Lauri was just talking about. Actually, you can you can download memory, human memory, and you can upload memory in brain directly. So the the, the company is going to create chip and it's again based on AI and these kind of technologies. So the, the this innovation is not going to stop and there is need at a certain extent. And that's why approval given to these companies to create those technologies. I think this idea about the truth and trying to get at the truth is, is particularly interesting. I mean, I've got an academic interest in politics and elections. And I mm. think we're already very on our guard now about what we what we think we know or what we don't know. And I, I can foresee, well, I think we're already getting there, aren't we? I foresee a, a future where these images that, that AI can create are so effective that you don't know whether it's a photograph taken in real life no. or... And it's or, happening now. It, it, and it is happening. And I, I feel like we were, we were already rightly very cynical about what we believed or what we didn't believe. And this is going to make that not only very, very difficult, but also on the other side of things, if people have done something in real life and it is true they can then blame sort of this being a deep fake yeah. or whatever yeah. and, say, and say that it never happened. Yeah. So yeah. again, this is, I know I've spent a lot of time here pushing back with you guys and sort of putting putting some of the devil's advocate negative positions to you. But this this is a this is something to be concerned about, isn't so it? So this is definitely the, the, the area that we need to be concerned about. It would magnify the problems that existed in social media world. So we, if we have misinformation in social media, now that going to be multiplied 100 times mm -hmm. because there you still had to bear to find out. You could just check the you know source. Chat GPT or the generative AI producing the information that you aren't able to track the, the source. You're just getting the output. So you would never able to get to know what is the kind of, you know, if, if it is right or it's not right. So what we are seeing now is going to be many, many times mm. uh, more problematic. And I think that's where, that's what I emphasize that the governance, governance come to data label. So what kind of data have been used to train these uh, systems yeah. uh, and and what are the sources and who is doing it? All these things and and you can see that uh, I think we seen recently uh, OpenAI saying that they might be drew from uh, uh, Europe because of the tight regulations and all those things. But in my view, the reg there should be balance in terms of how tight the regulations should be. Mm. Regulations shouldn't be so tight that it kills the innovation, okay? It should give the breathing space, but at also it should actually ensure that uh, people would not face negative consequences because of the uh, magnified mis misinformation, deep fakes, and all other uh, similar kind of problems. I'm quite cynical on governance. I don't think it'll happen uh, in the short term. I think there's not a, a motivation by decision makers yet to really uh, do anything about it. They leave it to big tech and whatever. I think the next big test for Gen AI is the next presidential cycle. 
and you can see 2024. So you can see now things seeping through where uh, Trump did a CNN in town hall um, a few weeks ago and um, the GOP, the Republicans, produced a, um, a snippet of uh, Jake Tapper uh, giving a, a summary of what went on that particular night. And they used uh, gender AI to adapt what he was saying to be more favorable to, 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 to Trump. And I think that they're going to be using Gen AI to um, produce all sorts of things um, to the respective voting public who will believe. Let's say that, you know, 2% believe what they're seeing. Let's say 5%. I don't know whatever the figure is. That might be enough then. So they've got that false created message across using Gen AI. And if people are looking at a, at a, at a, a, a video, a bit of multimedia, they will believe that. They may not question it. They're not minded to do so. Mm. And that's frightening, really. I'm just going to ask one last kind of broad philosophical thing about about all of this, which is the extent to which you think it has the the possibility to kind of dehumanise us in in, in mm. a sense of you know if if you can get information very quickly. I mean, there is there is value just for I guess the soul, isn't there? Sometimes in just reading a novel or mm. reading a book or doing something which you might not, which AI might help you not have to do, but you could still do. And I wonder if even there might be a, a, a kickback against this in that it becomes almost more fashionable, say, to go for a walk in the countryside or go surfing or go or, or leave your phone behind just for a, a, an afternoon when you go out or something like that, just so that you can disengage and know what you're doing is a, a, a human, real, as it were, experience and not something which, you know, you're not sure if it's actually happened or not because the the, the image might have been been doctored. I, I don't know. What, what, how, how do you respond to that? I think you've almost answered your own question, really. By that, I mean... If I had a choice to go for a walk in the park at the crack of dawn, to hear the birds singing, yeah. to experience the yeah. sun arising, to sort of say hello to people as I'm walking across the path or take a taxi. As a human, I want some pleasure perhaps and to experience it. And I don't think that will change. I still love reading books, even though I can do something more, more quicker. I can ask a question into ChatGPT to, to summarise a novel for me. Mm. But I would not want to do that. But younger people tend to have a shorter uh, um, sort of attention span. I was they? going they, to they, say you know, that. TikTok has encouraged that, yeah. for example. But it's... I, I, I would imagine it's an uphill struggle to get more young people yeah. to, for example, read novels, which is so enriching as a, as a process for you. I mean, younger people... Uh, it's just not chat GPT and generative AI, mm. but other developments are also yeah, happening. Iceberg, yeah. For example, metaverse, right? So combination of kind of metaverse, which is al already you have lots of immersive environments like Roblox, Fortnite, many other, those kind of where people go and do gaming hours. Um, now, the combination of these technologies obviously will have impact on how we do things. And definitely how we think and Lowry thinks and you think is different from what now 10-year-olds think, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have different way of doing things. They rely more on technology. They enjoy with technology. While our, our own enjoyment is more outside, mm -hmm. more outdoors. So it's... it's it, Going, so you will see this kind of a two world, one for those who actually old and growing and the one that are younger. Mm -hmm. So for them, this technology will change their behavior. Yeah. 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 I suspect I'm just getting getting old and, and pessimistic, but I, <laughs> but there is, there, there is, and I'm sure that every single generation says what I'm about to say, but I, I do suspect that younger people, and I've got godchildren and whatever, uh, seem to think more like each other. They're less mm. independently minded. And I and I just wonder if this has got something, to, sort of a role to play there. I don't know. No, look, technology does play a role, right? Mm. It does have impact. And how we cope with it is a different matter. You see nowadays, um, how how f long you can be away from your mobile? Oh, it's terrifying. Yeah, yeah? I, I don't how even long? like it. And I'm you constantly... are on your dinner table. Yeah. We are on our dinner yeah. table. And lots of families, still they keep their mobile. And uh, rather than engaging with each other uh, on dinner table, they actually looking at phone. Mm -hmm. Or you are with friend, but not with friend because you're still on uh, your mobile. You, you're looking at, you're interacting with your friend who is next to you, but but on mobile, mm -hmm. uh, not not in person. So it's just the, the different way of uh, thinking and doing things uh, that technology has actually made us 
do yeah. or it made us adopt. And you can see the societal implications of tech society. So Japan, for example, big gaming culture, mm. big technology um, focused culture. And um, some of the sort of, you know, Gen Z, um, uh, perhaps older people uh, wanting to meet girlfriends and things like that, uh, just don't know how to start really. And perhaps some feel that they don't need a partner because they've been immersed in this sort of virtual reality for quite some time. And then when they step out in the real world, it becomes very difficult for them. Really. Yeah, yeah. Stressful. And, and I just want to add, you mentioned about obviously uh, people reading novel or, you know, anything like that, enjoying that. It's like, these technologies creating attention deficiency. So people cannot focus more than 10 minutes, 15 minutes on anything. Mm. Uh, and, and regardless how engaging that novel or book is. And that, again, is just changing behavior. They want to do things quickly. They want to know uh, or, or learn or watch shorter uh, yeah. movies, shorter entertainment pieces uh, and readings. Um, rather than the the way we used to do, you know, sit down two hours with family, enjoy the movie, enjoy the talk and all other things. I think this is different. Mm -hmm. It's already different. And it's, these technologies will, uh, again, you know, make them more yeah. towards that direction. Yeah. Now, I know no academics work totally in isolation or in silos, but obviously this is such a big topic. You guys must collaborate and work with people well beyond this university, networks, other academics. I mean, who who do you work with? Oh, well, even for just this paper, we wrote a perspective paper on ChatGPT, mm. which includes about 73 co-authors. Wow. Uh, so number of colleagues from UK, uh, I mean, I can count number of universities, and many countries in, uh, across the globe, USA, India, um, China, and many other countries, actually. So we collaborated to write that paper uh, where we actually presented different perspective about these concerns, mm -hmm. uh, challenges, opportunities. Uh, so we've been working for a long time. I work closely with, uh, with lots of people in India, many uh, leading institutions like Indian Institute of Management, um, National Institute of um, uh, Industrial Engineering in Mumbai, uh, IITs, uh, different IITs. In India, in Europe, we have uh, lots of collaboration uh, as well as in uh, states and Australia. So we be working on uh, AI since last four years on AI, uh, chat GPT, uh, with lots of different collaborators. Mm -hmm. Not naming here, but uh, yeah. Yes, it's um, a very hot topic at the moment. So uh, a lot of academics are thinking about the implications. It might be in whatever genre uh, of subject matter they're working in. Uh, a lot of sort of opinion-based pieces, not so much empirical work, but that will evolve over time. It'd be nice to see uh, over the next sort of few months and years, the impact in specific industries. It might be manufacturing, it might be marketing, whatever, where there's evidence of how this particular technology is changing the way people work, how business models are evolving. Uh, but it'll take time over longitudinal type of study. Yeah. So, a final question, and just in a nutshell, if, if there's people listening to you guys speak, probably young people in particular, and they're thinking, I want to get into this line of work, specifically the kind of work that you do uh, the, and, and the way in which you come at this topic. What advice would you give them? What should they, what should they do to get more involved? Well, learning about it. And, and this is kind of technology you will get to know more by doing uh, and by, by interacting others. And lots of resources nowadays available in the form of podcast, in the form of uh, videos, uh, YouTube videos and all, with lots of experts pushing these kind of content. As Laurie said that, it's all at this point of time, it's mostly viewpoints, opinions, news media that is prevalent. So try to gain as much as possible. Uh, and, you know, be careful what you're reading. That's very important. Be careful what you are getting content. Think and judge before you believe. Uh, that's very, very important because so much coming and so many people saying so many different things, actually. Yeah. And sometimes those things are contradictory. Well, I was going to say, what, what, what are they going to believe yeah. sometimes, isn't it? It's not so, straightforward. Yeah, so the, the need to be critical 
is more than before. Understood. That's my message. Great. I think the great thing for um, people who want to get involved in Gen AI, uh, whether it's a career or just an interest, there's a lot of information out there, as Yogesh is saying. But of course, you can use these tools for free. You can open an account in uh, in Bard or in uh, ChatGPT 3.5. It costs you nothing. And I think that if you think about how things may evolve in the future, I think I really think one of the key skills will be knowing how to get the best out of one or more of these tools, perhaps a collection of them. And you think of a role, it might be technology plumber, for example. I know that phrase doesn't exist, but something like that, mm -hmm. where you've got a business problem you've got to solve. And okay, well, I can do that for your bard here. I can bring in Dali 2 to do something else. And I can do these particular prompts to get the best out of these tools. That is going to be a huge in-demand skill. And what we've not spoken about here, but probably would need to as well, is that that means that what the other stuff that we teach people in terms of IT skills yeah. and and engineering or whatever it will be, we'll need to really catch up with all of this sure. as, as well. Yeah, Look, it's been a really, really interesting conversation. I, I came in, I guess, a bit sceptical about things and, and still am, but maybe perhaps less so after <laughs> listening to you guys make your point. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. If you want to find out more about Yogesh and Laurie's research, you can visit their staff profile pages on Swansea University's website. To find out more about this podcast and Swansea University's research, visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. That's all from us today. Thank you for listening and thank you once again to my guests, Professor Yogesh Tavelli and Dr. Laurie Hughes. If you've enjoyed this episode, please follow us. I'm Sam Blaxland and that was Exploring Global Problems from Swansea University.